Hello and welcome to Lesson 1.3 for the System Security Certified Practitioner course Document and Maintain Functional Security Controls So on the agenda for today we have Deterrent Controls Preventative Controls Detective Controls Corrective Controls and Compensating Controls So let's begin Risk is dealt with using five types of controls Deterrent, Preventative, Detective, Corrective and Compensating it's important to note that many of these controls will overlap. For example, a wall around a perimeter will both prevent and deter attackers from attempting to cross the property line. This section will focus on security controls, which are a subset of risk mitigation. Security controls are those which interfere with the human attacker or the software or hardware they are using, who is carrying out an unauthorized intrusion into your information systems or causing damage or disruption to those systems. So let's begin with deterrent controls. Deterrent controls are designed to dissuade an attacker from beginning or continuing an attack on your system's information, property or people. The goal of having deterrent controls in place is to raise the cost of an attack or level of risk an attacker would have to undertake. An example of a deterrent control would be having a guard patrol the perimeter of your property. Deterrent controls need to be visible, observable and clearly present to the potential attacker in order for them to work. The objective is to essentially scare the attacker away from attempting an attack. Deterrent controls also add a layer of additional perceived barriers. For example, if an attacker sees guards patrolling the perimeter, they may assume that there are more guards elsewhere. Examples of deterrent controls include the following. Physical controls such as fences, walls, locked doors and windows, barriers, moving spotlights, etc. Most physical controls are passive, meaning they do not react to an intrusion attempt. Active controls include guards patrolling, guard dogs, and security controls. The architecture of buildings or workspaces can also be considered powerful deterrents to potential attackers. For example, modern embassy compounds around the world are often designed with blast-hardened walls, impact-resisting barriers, and armed military personnel. These clear shows of security are deterrents for any would-be attackers. Network systems can act as powerful deterrents by preventing an attacker from gaining meaningful insight via reconnaissance, probes or scans. Examples of these network systems include firewalls and intrusion detection and prevention systems. Another example of an effective deterrent are highly aware, well-trained people in an organisation. They can act as deterrents by deflecting social engineering attack attempts to a potential honeypot of false information, thereby misleading the attacker. Moving on to preventative controls. Preventative controls can provide passive or active protection. The same type of controls used for physical passive deterrence also bring some prevention with them. Preventative controls keep systems from harm by reducing the probability of an occurrence of a risk or by containing the risk in such a way as to limit the spread of its disruption or damage. For example, a locked door will prevent an attacker from gaining entry to the premises unless they want to elevate their level of risk by breaking the lock or the door. Examples of preventative controls include firewalls, identity management and access control systems, and intrusion detection and prevention systems. These controls are often used in conjunction with one another to provide a solid prevention architecture. They work by detecting attempts to cross a controlled access point boundary, testing this access attempt against sets or criteria, and sometimes issuing challenges to request further credentials from the requesting subject. These systems have the ability to sound alarms or alerts for failures and can generate log information for successfully authenticated attempts. As such, they are deterrent, prevention and detection systems all at the same time. Detective controls then. Detective controls, also known as detection controls, are designed to look for any out of limits conditions, like signatures associated with an intrusion attempt and then take two actions based on this information. Firstly, the detective control will notify the appropriate personnel that a problem exists, allowing an effective response to the incident to begin. Secondly, the detection controls can signal to an attacker that it has picked up on their intrusion attempt, which would lead them to believe that security personnel will be responding to their attack. The goal of this is to deter the attacker from continuing their efforts. However, a detection control may not always want an attacker to know it has caught their behaviour. Physical detection systems include motion detectors, sensors, and continuity circuits embedded into walls or fences. These systems can also support change detection, 
which will cause an alert if, for example, the temperature of a room changes or if movement is detected. All detective systems are subject to error rates. The ideal detection system will balance the risk of harm due to false positive with the cost of investigating and resolving false negatives. The point in between these areas is known as the crossover point. Corrective controls. Corrective controls are designed to contain, isolate or restore services which have been disrupted for any reason. An uninterrupted power supply, UPS, is an example of a corrective control. They work by isolating or buffering your IT and communication systems from external commercial electrical power supply providers. This allows them to correct any temporary undervoltage, overvoltage, spikes in power or other problems before they cause damage or interruption to equipment. Another example of a corrective control is when an access control system quarantines or remediates a subject's access request when it determines that something about the subject or access request is not fully correct. Systems can then interrogate the subject's device to ensure it is fully up to date, anti-malware is installed, etc. and redirect the connection to a remediation server where repair actions must be taken if necessary. Systems can also ask subjects to provide further authentication credentials if it detects something strange about the subject's location or the time of day. For example, if a user requests access to a resource at 2 a.m., the system may refuse access or require another layer of authentication, as if this is a strange or unusual time for a user to be working. Compensating controls. Compensating controls are used when a rec recommended, required, or normal risk mitigation control is not available. They are also used if the normal risk mitigation control is unworkable, not affordable, or when another approach has been chosen for valid reasons. There are usually strict, formalized processes for justifying the use of a compensating control. For example, PCI DSS, which is the Payment Card Industry Standard, provide a working definition of a compensating control and states that a compensating control must do the following. Meet or exceed the intended level of protection as specified in the original control requirement, provide a level of protection that sufficiently offsets or covers the risk that the original control requirements would address, must provide greater levels of protection against the total risk set that the originating or reference standard addresses that would be achieved by the original control requirement. And finally, must provide a degree of overall safety and security that is in par with the risk of not using the recommended or required original standard in whole or part. An example of a compensating control would be the following. Imagine there is a requirement in PCI DSS, for example, that requires passwords to be of a minimum length and complexity. Using a multi-factor authentication system, common sense allows us to do away with the need to constrain or dictate user choices of passwords, since they are not the sole means of gaining access and privileges. It is important to note that when talking about compensating with regard to security and risk controls, there is no additional residual risk just because we have replaced the original required control approach with something different. If there is a residual risk due to the implementation of a compensated control, then it is probably not the right choice. So in this lesson, we have covered deterrent controls, preventative controls, detective controls, corrective controls, and compensating controls. That brings us to the end of this lesson. Thank you for watching. In the next lesson, we will cover asset management lifecycle. Thank you.